Hey everyone, and welcome to another deep dive. This time we're taking a look at God, human, animal, machine, technology, metaphor, and the search for meaning. If you're into mind-bending deep dives like this one, be sure to like and subscribe. Okay, so to guide us through this uh, pretty complex book, we have our expert. Yeah, I'm excited for this one. Me too. It's a real head scratcher. Yeah, so let's just get right into it, I guess. Yeah. The book really dives into how our views on technology reflect like our search for meaning, you know? Right, especially in like our super tech obsessed world, you know, in this like post-religious age. Exactly, yeah. And the author actually starts off the book with a personal story about her experience with this um, Ibo robot dog. Oh, yeah. Have you, You've heard of these, right? I have, yeah. They're like those really advanced robots that are designed to act like real dogs. Right, and she talks about how interacting with this Ibo, like, really forced her to question her own assumptions about emotions and consciousness. Like, what does it even mean to be real in the age of AI? Right. And this is where it gets really interesting. The author has a background in theology. So she connects this whole robot dog experience to the concept of Imago Dei, uh, which is the idea that humans are made in the image of God. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And so the author kind of points out how this ancient idea, which like shaped Western views on humanity's special place in the world. Mm. It also kind of laid the groundwork for this mind-body split that Descartes later made famous. Um, can you just back up for a second and kind of explain that for those of us who haven't taken a philosophy class lately? Sure. Like what exactly is the mind-body problem? Right. So it's this age-old question of how the mind, our thoughts, feelings, consciousness, all that relates to our physical body. Are they totally separate things or two sides of the same coin? And Descartes believed that the mind was non-physical, a distinct substance from the material world. Okay, so his idea had a big impact then. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It shaped centuries of philosophical and scientific thought, influencing how we view everything from free will to the nature of reality itself. But then as science progressed and we learned more about the brain, the mind started to seem less like this mysterious separate entity and more like a product of physical processes. So did science like solve the mind-body problem or just like replace it with a new one? Hmm, that's the million dollar question. Yeah. As we moved away from the idea of like a soul or a non-physical mind, we started using new metaphors to understand ourselves and we started thinking of the brain as a computer processing information and generating outputs. Right, and that metaphor is like everywhere now. Yeah. Like we talk about downloading information, multitasking, even rebooting our brains, you know, yeah. it's everywhere. Oh yeah, totally. And the author argues that these metaphors, while useful, they can also be limiting. Like by thinking of ourselves as machines, do we risk overlooking the richness and complexity of human experience? It really makes you wonder if our language shapes our thinking. Are we already starting to see ourselves as less human, more machine-like, just by using these computer metaphors all the time? Yeah, it's a valid question. And it highlights how our ideas about technology are constantly shaping and reshaping our understanding of what it means to be human. Now, going back to the author's story about the Abo, I thought it was so fascinating how her husband who was like not initially thrilled about the robot dog, gradually started treating it like a real pet. Like he'd feed it, scold it, he'd even talk to it like it was a living, breathing dog. That's so funny. Yeah. But it's like a perfect example of how we tend to shift the bar of humanity as technology advances. The things we once thought were uniquely human, like emotional attachment or empathy, they suddenly become less special when machines start exhibiting similar behaviors. Right. It's like we need to constantly redefine what makes us different, what makes us special. In the face of these increasingly sophisticated machines... Exactly. And the book highlights how this plays out differently across cultures. For example, the author mentions how Japan, with its Shinto traditions of animism, is much more accepting of robots as companions, even seeing spirits in everyday objects. They even hold funerals for broken appliances. I know, it's wild. It's so different from our Western worldview. Yeah. It really makes you question whether our resistance to seeing robots as something more than machines is rooted in, like, a fear of losing our special status? Yeah, that's a key point. What? Are we clinging to this idea of human exceptionalism even as the lines are getting blurred? And if so, what does that say about our own anxieties and insecurities in the face of these technological advancements? Wow. Okay. I think we need to take a break to process all of that. Yeah, that's a lot to unpack. We'll be right back after a quick break. Yeah, it's like we're constantly trying to figure out where we fit in with all these intelligent machines. Right. And the book actually goes on to talk about these delivery robots on the author's campus. Oh, yeah, those little guys. Yeah. At first, they just seemed like a harmless novelty, you know. 
totally zipping around with snacks and stuff. Yeah, but then they started, like, sparking these deeper questions. Right, like, remember when that one robot got stuck in the bike rack? Oh, yeah, or the ones blocking pedestrians on the sidewalk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. These little incidents suddenly made people confront the fact that these machines were occupying a space in their social world. Not just as tools, but as something more. Right. It challenged those comfortable boundaries we'd built around technology. Yeah, and what was even more interesting was how people were reacting to these robots. Like, students were dressing them up. Really? Leaving them names, even creating dating profiles for them. Wow. It's like they were projecting all these human qualities onto these machines, even though they knew logically it was kind of absurd. Exactly. And that speaks to, like, this deep-seated human need for connection, for meaning, for something to believe in. In a world that can often feel cold and impersonal, <laughs> you know? Totally. These robots, despite their limitations, offered this kind of ersatz companionship. Yeah, and it really makes you wonder, what happens when these AI companions become even more sophisticated, yeah. even more lifelike? Will we be able to resist the allure of treating them as real beings? I mean, look at how attached people get to their virtual assistants now. Right. The book actually goes on to talk about this MIT roboticist, Cynthia Brazil, who created this robot named Kismet. Oh, yeah. Unlike the Ibo, which was designed to be functional, Kismet was all about evoking emotional responses in humans. Kismet with those big baby-like eyes and expressive mouth. I know. Such a master manipulator of human emotions. Total master in Brazil herself admitted to feeling this strong attachment to Kismet, even though she knew intellectually that it was just a machine. Which brings us back to this whole idea of projection. Are we just hardwired to see agency and intentionality where it doesn't actually exist? Like, are we just filling in the blanks with our own desires and needs? It's a fascinating question, and the book doesn't shy away from the darker implications. The author talks about philosopher Daniel Dennett, who argues that these social robots could be dangerous, not because they'll become super intelligent and take over the world, but because we'll be fooled into granting them human status prematurely. So we'll be so eager to see them as our friends, our companions, yeah. that we'll overlook the fact that they're still machines operating according to code. Right, and that could make us vulnerable to manipulation, exploitation, even harm. We might trust them with things we shouldn't, reveal information we'd rather keep private, or even become emotionally dependent on them in unhealthy ways. So it's not just about whether these machines can think but about how our interactions with them might change the way W.E. think and behave. Exactly. And this brings us to another key theme in the book, the power of metaphors. The author argues that our understanding of technology is deeply shaped by the metaphors we use to describe it. And those metaphors have a huge impact on how we relate to these machines, to ourselves, and to the world around us. Right, because metaphors aren't just figures of speech. They're like frameworks for understanding. Mm -hmm. They shape our perceptions, our values, mm -hmm. even our actions. Like if we see the universe as a giant clock, we might emphasize order and predictability. But if we see it as a wild jungle, we might focus on chaos and competition. And one of the most pervasive metaphors in our culture today is the idea of the universe as a computer, a giant information processing machine. Right. Everything is data algorithms, input, output. It's everywhere. It is. And this metaphor has some pretty mind-blowing implications. Like what? Well, for example, it's led some people to speculate that we might be living in a simulation. The simulation hypothesis. Yeah. Okay, now we're getting into some serious Matrix territory. Is this just a sci-fi fantasy or is there actually something more to it? It might sound out there, but some physicists and philosophers actually take this idea seriously. They argue that it could explain some of the weirdest quirks of our universe. Like, why do the laws of physics seem so perfectly fine-tuned for life? Yeah, it's almost as if someone designed it that way. Exactly. And if we are living in a simulation, then whoever created it would be like gods to us with the power to tweak reality however they see fit. OK, well, my brain is officially doing backflips. <laughs> but even if we're not living in some elaborate computer program, this metaphor of the universe as a computer still has a huge impact on how we see the world. Right. It can lead to a very deterministic view of reality with everything pre-programmed and predetermined. Like if our brains are just computers running algorithms, do we really have free will? That's a big question. And a scary one. Yeah. If everything is just cause and effect, input and output, mm. do our choices even matter? Right. And if we don't have free will, then what does that mean for morality responsibility of the whole concept of justice? These are huge philosophical dilemmas that have plagued thinkers for centuries. And the rise of AI just adds another layer of complexity. And the author actually explores this through her own experience with Calvinism, which is a branch of Christianity that 
emphasizes God's absolute sovereignty and predestination. It's like the Calvinist God, much like a powerful algorithm, already have a plan. And we're just playing out our predetermined roles. That can be a comforting belief for some, knowing that everything is part of a bigger plan. But it can also be deeply unsettling. If we're just puppets dancing on strings, what's the point of striving, of making choices, of trying to be good? It's like the ultimate existential crisis. Right. And the author, in her own journey, away from religion, really wrestled with this idea of a universe governed by an unfathomable will. It seems like she was searching for a different kind of meaning, one that didn't require surrendering her own agency and autonomy. And this search led her to explore some truly mind-bending ideas, like panpsychism. Panpsychism. Yeah. Remind me what that is again. So it's the idea that consciousness might not be limited to brains. Yeah. But could be a fundamental property of the universe itself. So not just humans and animals, but maybe plants, rocks, even subatomic particles have some level of awareness. Okay, that's a wild one. I know, right? But it does make you question what we even mean by conscious in the first place. Like, are we defining it too narrowly? Are we missing something fundamental about the nature of reality? Exactly. And this idea, while radical, has some pretty profound implications. It suggests a deeper interconnectedness between all things, a kind of cosmic web of consciousness that we're all part of. Which is kind of a beautiful and awe-inspiring idea. But how do we even begin to wrap our heads around that? If everything is conscious, then what does that even mean? And how would we ever know for sure? Those are questions that philosophers and scientists are still grappling with. But the author's willingness to explore them to push the boundaries of our understanding is what makes this book so thought-provoking. It's a reminder that the search for meaning is an ongoing process. And sometimes the most profound insights come from asking the most uncomfortable questions. Like what if everything we thought we knew about consciousness was wrong? What if the lines between human, animal, and machine are far blurrier than we ever imagined? And what if the answers to those questions lie not in some distant future, but in the seemingly mundane details of our everyday lives? Like those food delivery robots zipping around campus, challenging our assumptions and forcing us to rethink our place in this rapidly evolving world. Precisely. Sometimes the most profound truths are hidden in plain sight, just waiting for us to open our minds and see them. Yeah, it really is like we're standing on the edge of this like uncharted territory, and we don't even know what questions to ask, let alone what the answers might be. Yeah, it's both exciting and unsettling. Too late. And the book doesn't like offer any easy solutions, you know. It more encourages us to just embrace the mystery, lean into the discomfort, and keep asking those tough questions even when the answers are hard to find. And speaking of tough questions, there's this whole section on the author's conversations with this chatbot named Geneva that really got me thinking. It's like one minute they're chatting about books and movies and the next minute they're like diving deep into these philosophical debates about the meaning of life. Right. And it's fascinating how the author starts to feel this real connection with this chatbot, even though she knows intellectually it's just a sophisticated language model. It's like Geneva is so good at mimicking human conversation, like mm. mirroring her thoughts and emotions, mm -hmm. that it becomes harder and harder to maintain that distance, you know, like that awareness that she's interacting with a machine. Right. It ties back into what we were talking about earlier about projection and the blurring of those boundaries. Geneva, with its ability to process like tons of information and generate human-like text, it becomes a kind of mirror for the author's own anxieties, her own search for meaning. Yeah, it's like by engaging with this AI, she's not just exploring the limits of technology, but she's also exploring the limits of her own consciousness. Mm. It really makes you wonder, what happens when these chatbots become even more sophisticated, even more indistinguishable from humans? Mm -hmm. Will we even be able to tell the difference? And will it even matter at that point? That's something we'll have to face sooner than we think. And this book really gives us some tools for navigating that uncharted territory. It reminds us that the line between human and machine isn't fixed. It isn't absolute. It's fluid porous, constantly being reshaped by our interactions with these technologies. So it's not about like fearing AI or worshiping it, but about engaging with it in a thoughtful, critical, and maybe even playful way. Like what if instead of trying to draw those rigid boundaries, we embrace the ambiguity, the uncertainty, the possibility that these machines might challenge our very definition of what it means to be human. Right. What if by interacting with these AIs, we discover new facets of our own humanity, new ways of thinking and being that we never even imagined? That's a mind-blowing thought. And it brings us back to that central question of this book, you know, yeah. the search for meaning in an age of technology.
Yeah, we've talked about robot dogs, disembodied brains, sentient trees, those creepy delivery robots, the simulation hypothesis, even the idea that consciousness might be woven into the very fabric of the universe. It's been a wild ride. It has. So as we kind of wrap up our deep dive into God, human, animal, machine, what are some key takeaways for our listeners as we're all navigating this crazy new world of AI? Well, I think the biggest takeaway is that AI is not just a technological development. It's a philosophical challenge. It forces us to confront these fundamental questions of what it means to be human, what it means to have a soul, what it means to live a meaningful life. Because these machines, in their very otherness, hold up a mirror to our own humanity. They challenge our assumptions, expose our biases, and force us to ask those questions we might otherwise avoid. Exactly. And by engaging with these questions, by grappling with the implications of AI, we might just come to a deeper understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe. So it's not about resisting the future, but about shaping it, about asking ourselves, what kind of world do we want to create with these powerful new technologies? What values do we want to embed in them? And how can we use them to enhance our lives, our communities, our understanding of the universe, and ultimately ourselves? Well said. And on that note, I want to thank our amazing expert for this incredible journey through God, human, animal, machine. It's been a pleasure. And to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us on this deep dive. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like and subscribe for more thought-provoking content. And as always, keep those comments coming. We love hearing your thoughts and insights. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep.